Uh, verse 35, part 4, I'll start with paragraph 9. Uh, take a look at 35, part 1, if you haven't, please. So, start with paragraph 9 here. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I mean paragraph 7. We will start at paragraph 7. With regard to the learned professions, little need be observed. They truly form no distinct interest in society, and according to their situation and talents, will be indiscriminately the objects of confidence and choice of each other and of other parts of the community. Remember, learned class mostly is thinking about uh, lawyers. Nothing remains but the landed interest, and this in a political view, and particularly in relation to taxes, I take to be perfectly united from the wealthy, wealthiest landlord to the poorest tenant. No tax can be laid on land which will not affect the proprietor of millions of acres as well as the proprietor of a single acre. Every landholder will therefore have a common interest to, to keep the taxes on land as low as possible, and common interest may always be wrecked upon as the surest bond of sympathy. So here, just like I said in part one, here he says, even if you elect a very uh, rich landowner who owns thousands of acres, uh, his interests dictate that he will be passing laws that will not hurt himself and down the line hurt the person that has got even one acre of land. Okay, so he says, uh, just this thing organically works to the advantage of everybody. But if we even could suppose a distinction of interest between the opulent landholder and the middling farmer, what reason is there to conclude that the first would stand a better chance of being deputed to the national legislature than the last? If we take fact as our guide and look into our own Senate and Assembly, we shall find that moderate proprietors of land prevail in both. When he says our Senate, he's talking about state of New York's Senate. So just look at our senators in the state of New York. They are from all classes, middle, middling class. They're, they're not, some of them are not super rich, just they've got small uh, amount of acreage. So he says the same will be true in the national government too or he hopes. If we take fact as our guide and look into our own Senate and Assembly, we shall find that moderate proprietors of land prevail in both. Nor is this less the case in the Senate, which consists of a smaller number than in the Assembly, which is composed of a greater number. Where the qualifications of the electors are the same, whether they have to choose a small or large number, their votes will fall upon those in whom they have most confidence. Whether these happen to be men of large fortunes or of moderate property or of no property at all. It is said to be necessary that all classes of citizens should have some of their own number in the representative body, in order that their feelings and interests may be better understood and attended to. But we have seen that this will never happen under any arrangement that leaves the votes of the people free. Where this is the case, the representative body, with too few 
exceptions to have any influence on the spirit of the government will be composed of landholders, merchants, and men of learned professions. But where is the danger that the interests and feelings of these of the different classes of citizens will not be understood or attended to by these three descriptions of men? Will not the landholder know and feel whatever will promote or injure the interests of the landed property? And will he not from his own interest in that species of property be sufficiently prone to resist every attempt to prejudice or encumber it? Will not the merchant understand and be disposed to cultivate as far as many as far as may be proper, the interests of the mechanic and manufacturing arts to which his commerce is so nearly allied? Will not the man of learned profession, who will feel a neutrality to the rivalships between the different branches of industry, be likely to prove an impartial arbiter between them, ready to promote either? so far as it shall appear to him conducive to the general interests of the society. If we take into, into the account the momentary humors or dispositions which may happen to prevail in particular parts of the society and to which as a wise administration will never be inattentive, when he's talking about humors, he's talking about something like a sickness. Like if something bad happens, you know, um, like a bad group takes control of, a, of the power or, uh, or has a lot of influence. So that's when he's talking about humors or dispositions, that's what he's talking about. All right. Let me restart this paragraph. If we take into the account the momentary humors or dispositions which may happen to prevail in particular parts of the society and to which a wise administration will never be inattentive, is the man whose situation leads to extensive inquiry and information less likely to be a competent judge of their nature, extent and foundation than one whose observation does not travel beyond the circle of his neighbors and acquaintances? Is it not natural that a man who is a candidate for the favor of the people and who is dependent on the suffrage of his fellow citizens for the continuance of public honors should take care to inform himself of their dispositions and inclinations and should be willing to allow them their proper degree of influence upon his conduct? This dependence and the necessity of being bound himself and his posterity by the laws which he gives his assent are the true and they are the strong courts of sympathy between the representative and the constituent. This last part is very important because he says when these people are in office, when they are members of the House or the Senators, the laws they pass, they will be such that they know they will leave the House of Representatives, they will leave the Senate, and that law will apply to them. So they'll try to be fair and just and wise. So that's, that's his... Uh, thinking at the time. That's why he says, because at that time, you know, uh, in the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, the first Constitution of the United States, after three years, you would be out. You would be term limited. You'd have to rotate out of office. So their view was still kind of with the old Constitution. They did not see it like it is these days where people stay in office for such a long time. 
And unfortunately now when they leave office, they become, they go work for different companies as lobbyists. But this is what he's thinking. He's thinking a great representative democracy, a republic, where people realize that they will have to live under the same laws that they pass. Okay, the last paragraph, there is no part of the administration of government that requires extensive information and a thorough knowledge of the principles of political economy so much as the business of taxation. The man who understands those principles best will be least likely to resort to oppressive expedients or to sacrifice any particular class of citizens to the procurement of revenue. It might be demonstrated that the most productive system of finance will always be the least burdensome. There can be no doubt that in order to a judicious exercise of the power of taxation, it is necessary that the person in whose hands it is should be acquainted with the general genius, habits, and modes of thinking of the people at large and with the resources of the country. And this is all that can be reasonably meant by a knowledge of the interests and feelings of the people. In any case, in any other sense, the proposition has either no meaning or an absurd one. And in that sense, let every considerate citizen judge for himself where the requisite qualification is most likely to be found. See, notice Hamilton says that, and he knew that because his expertise were in finance, he was real good with numbers and finances, and he actually ends up becoming the first Secretary of Treasury. So he indirectly is saying that I am qualified to talk about this. I know what I'm talking about, he says.